Hey guys, hope you're having a good uh, Friday here. Uh, yeah, sometimes it just takes as long as it takes to get the videos ready. I had a uh, Sony Vegas crash on me here a couple times, but uh, 908, okay, well, we're a few minutes late, but uh, anyway, a little bit of uh, broken to overcast there. This was about an hour ago, shortly before sunset. And this is some of the, I guess we can call it upslope flow, above the uh, cold air dome that you see up across Texas right here. This is a pattern very much like what we saw yesterday with uh, northerly flow across Texas and upslope flow in the West Texas area. And we're catching a little bit of that cloud here on the eastern periphery of that region. Elsewhere, a very persistent high pressure pattern. We see northerly flow all across the eastern U.S. Pretty easy to kind of paint out those streamlines and they look just like that right there. So everything is dominated by the high pressure up in eastern Canada, way up there near the top. I can see a 1028 millibar reading way up there off the top over a Lake Superior. And let's take a look out west. A little bit uh, different pattern there. Looks like a little bit of stagnation. Maybe a new air mass coming out of the Pacific Northwest there. You can see some fresh northwesterly flow in that region right there. Elsewhere, looks like uh, winds are kind of light and variable. So we had that high pressure earlier in the week which was driving a little bit of polar air south and looks like the air mass has recovered because now you see over Phoenix and Vegas we're back to southwesterly flow there. So in fact it looks like uh, if we follow the isobars let's see we come up with something like that the cold isobars up to the north run like this so I think we're looking at a little bit of a frontal zone up in the Great Basin area. So we're going to put that roughly from about the Sacramento to Reno area and then back across eastern Idaho and then up into Wyoming. So this is going to be a, a bear clinic zone that we'll be looking for on the charts in that region. So somewhere in between we've probably got a bear clinic zone hung up in the mountains. So there's the uh, cool air mass over Texas, and this is the stagnant polar air mass, so I think we're probably looking at a boundary kind of like that. West of there, we see the westerly flow there. I guess maybe even further back we can put that boundary there. And then on the other side, we've got easterly flow across Albuquerque, definitely at uh, El Paso there with gusts up to 22 knots. And I think we've got a little bit of trapped air in the valleys there in Colorado, so maybe some of this polar air, maybe kind of over overriding the top of that a little bit. So that's the big picture, and let's uh, compare that to what we have on the isobars and thickness. Well, we've got a lot of uh, thermal gradient to look at here. There's a big one there in the nor northeast U.S., that proceeds up through the Great Lakes into the Hudson Bay area. Another Bear Clinic area way up off the top of the chart. Yeah, there it is up there in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, the core of the polar air mass appears to be over about Baffin Island, right in that region, extending down into Quebec. And then we've got more Bear Clinicity all the way through western Canada into the Pacific Ocean region like that. All right, so it's pretty easy to place the fronts based on this. This is about as good as it gets. So we're going to go something like that, maybe all the way back to Fort Nelson, and maybe up as a warm front into the Northwest Territories. So this is the synoptic scale frontal picture. And then maybe this extends back as a warm front, maybe something like that, or it could be maybe something like this here. And then the other frontal system, this is extending from around Maria, and there it goes. 
and then we would bring that probably into the uh, south of the U.S., something like that right there. So that's our rough guess, and uh, there's that high pressure over Ontario, and that's pushing the cold air south through the eastern U.S. like that. So northerly flow across the eastern U.S., and the only exception would be over Florida, which is still under a tropical air mass. The tail end of that front looks like it extends through Texas, and then it's hung up in the mountains like that right there. Okay, so uh, yeah, pretty uh, cut and dry there, and the coldest air mass looks like uh, over the Great Lakes area up into Quebec. The NHC forecast showing Maria has transitioned to a tropical storm, 988 millibars, and that's continuing to move off to the east. So that's completely out of the picture there. It appears we've got that depression coming together around Miami. And now we've got a new system. Well, what is this? Zero percent chance of formation in 48 hours. Okay, I guess they were looking for an area there, which is not expected to come together. No signs of development. However, conditions could become favorable next week. Okay, so anyway, that's more of a long-term thing there. The five-day tropical outlook. Okay, so we're putting whatever that wave is right there over the Bermuda region, or not the Bermuda, the Bahamas. So maybe a little development there. And then definitely we know we've know we been tra tracking this other system on the GFS around Miami, and that's going to move along the coast. And then we're expecting that to be picked up as an easterly wave into Georgia and then Alabama next week. Other than that, it uh, looks pretty quiet there in the tropics. Okay, there's the infrared satellite imagery. I don't think that gray looks very good. Let me fix that. Uh, we'll change that color. I don't know. Red? Huh. Some of these colors are not working very well. I'm going to try kind of a dark... Yeah, I guess we'll just deal with that right there. Okay, so there's our infrared imagery going back all the way to about 4 p.m. Eastern. So we'll run the infrared loop. This is about a four-hour loop, and uh, we see a lot of activity there in Florida. This is the little disturbance coming together in that region right there. And then we've got uh, quite a few clouds over Texas where we have the upslope flow taking place and looks like uh, a little bit of jet energy overriding that cold dome like that right there. And then of course we have the upper level system almost stationary over the central Rockies. So you can see a piece of that over Flo uh, Idaho moving south and then a piece up in Wyoming moving north. So that's uh, the rotation there. So we're going to place that upper level system in west central Wyoming like that right there. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, what should we look at? Oh yeah, there's one cool feature here. That's up in the Great Lakes area. Looks like a little vorticity lobe. This could be a little upper level system moving through the flow. So actually this would be maybe a little wave coming through. So we're going to look for that on the charts. Uh, that, in fact, I can just bring that up right now while we're looking at it. I'm going to switch over to the vorticity charts. Okay, so this will take just a second to come up. So we're going to go out to Meteostar and take a look at their vorticity panel. And uh, let's see. 
that appears to not be working so I'm going to go ahead and co-opt one of these other windows and I'm going to go to uh, I'm going to try picking another site, uh, Wix Maps. I haven't used uh, the Wix Maps site very much, but uh, let me see if I can pull up a chart here that has vorticity for North America, and we should be able to see that little lobe there. Okay, 500 millibar heights and vorticity. Since we're going to a new site, we have to kind of uh, take a look at the Valid times. This is uh, starting 29th at 12Z, so this is this morning. That looks uh, good. Okay, so this is the analysis for this morning. And there's the 500 millibar chart up at 18,000 feet showing that wave there over the Great Lakes area. So we're seeing that right now in this area here. So that's going to be in between frames. But we can see that's a very strong lobe there. And then by tomorrow morning, we're going to see that extending from about uh, the New York City area through Harrisburg and back to around Charleston, West Virginia. And out ahead of that, some pretty good upper level lift. And there it is right there. And it looks like uh, this little wave may be outrunning the uh, models. So this is kind of an example of... Uh, initializing and verifying the models there. So based on this I would expect the uh, cloud pattern to be kind of like that and it looks like the cloud pattern that we're seeing is already very close to that position. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and take a look at the chat, see what we got going on. Kind of a quiet night here. We've got uh, David Moore Cool with a half day of light rain in the Metroplex today. We have Electric Dog here and Fun with Tech, Kevin McKinney. David Moore says, thanks for taking the time to webcast tonight. Yeah, uh, not a problem there. I am in the, the middle of putting together a new book, so I am having to juggle quite a few things right now, but... 9 p.m. seems to be working out pretty well. Um, upslope flow, yeah, we're talking orographically, but more of a mesoscale to synoptic scale type uh, orographic. Uh, usually when we talk about orographic storms, we're talking about like uh, individual mountain ranges, individual mountain peaks. And upslope flow refers, I guess uh, you could say, to more of a large-scale event there. Uh, instead of over, like, minutes to a couple of hours, we're talking about over many hours to days to realize that upper-level lift. Ryan says the rain is coming down in South Florida. Tropical downpours there. 60 hours of solid tropical rain. And, yeah, we can see it right there might bring up the uh, radar. They're expecting it to clear out by Sunday evening as the disturbance moves up the coast. Flooding fast there. Wildlife is dr drowning in the highlands. No place to put the water. Can't flush it fast enough with the flood control systems. Flood advisory posted till 8. And Kathy is saying hello from windy and cool Wyoming. Okay, let me try to bring up the, the radar there. College to Page, always a good site to go to, and we can get different scales of radar. So I'm going to take a look at the one kilometer radar product, and we'll zoom that in on Florida. And there's that rain that we have. Uh, looks like the, the majority of it is up around the Titusville, uh, Cape Canaveral area. Quite a bit, a bit of it down here around uh, Fort Myers out towards the Everglades. And looks like things are kind of quiet at the moment around Miami and Fort Lauderdale. 
uh, maybe we can take a look at the storm total precip. I'm going to pull up the Miami radar. And uh, to get there, what we do is we go up to the, the top, we go to this uh, product menu, and then we'll find the storm total precip right there. So that'll give us an idea of how much rain has fallen. And it looks like the distribution is kind of uneven. Apparently some areas getting only about maybe a half inch to a quarter inch. Other areas getting about five to seven inches. And some areas looks like maybe even about seven to eight inches there. So there's the distribution within the range of the radar. So it looks like some of the areas that are heavily hit appear to be in the Fort Myers area in Naples, and that's where they had Irma move through, of course, a few weeks ago, ago there. Okay, we'll kind of go area by area. And I'll try to make this brief so we don't uh, uh, spend too much time where there's not much weather. But here, you can see the Pacific Air moving in. You can see, uh, let me make sure, okay, that's current data there. This is from 18Z, valid for 01Z. And we can see the westerly flow there across the Pacific Northwest. And we can also see the pressure rises, higher pressures out along the coast. And the isobars taken on this kind of appearance, showing the high pressure offshore here. So this is the cold air advection and the new air mass moving inland there in the Pacific Northwest. And then over the next 24 hours, quite a change there. Look at that. Uh, looks like tomorrow night, a lot of freezing temperatures in the higher elevations of the northern Rockies. So let's compare that to tonight. Okay, there's tonight. So you see the change there. Lows in the uh, 40s in the higher elevations there. And then we run that forward. Cold air advection overruns that area. And then for tomorrow night, now we're seeing temperatures ranging from the uh, 20s to the 30s and a few 40s there. And uh, Boise looking at about 40 and uh, 33, I think that's at uh, Butte, Montana. Southwestern U.S., let's check that out. There's the current conditions there. San Joaquin Valley continues to be very warm, 92 at Fresno and Bakersfield, and 95 in the Mojave Desert. And the winds, of course, are southwesterly there. So this is kind of becoming a tropical air mass. And then over the next 24 hours, very little change. Looks like a little bit of northwesterly flow picking up in northern Nevada. So I think we're bringing a little bit of the frontal air mass down south. You can see the flow coming northerly in the San Joaquin Valley. Temperatures dropping about 10 degrees there. So I think we're seeing the, the front coming through California there. Let me double check that. Yeah, definitely cooler tomorrow. And then uh, for Sunday, northerly flow in uh, Las Vegas. And then we see highs around 89 in <clears throat> Vegas and uh, 65 there at Tonopah. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, Southwesterly flow in Arizona there, northwesterly in California and Nevada. So this is probably painting out a situation like that with a front. Very weak front coming through Vegas and uh, into Southern California. The northern plains uh, showing the return flow there. High pressure over the Lake Superior area. And pressure falls in the high plains of Canada there. And so we have southeasterly flow. So this is going to be kind of a warm air advection pattern. And then you can see how warm things are by uh, tomorrow. 
we see lots of 70s and even uh, probably a few spots of 80 around Rapid City. And then we should see the cold front arrive, and there it comes. See that right there? That's the uh, cold air coming across into western Montana, and that spills eastward. And this is going to be uh, Sunday morning here. You can see the cold temperatures back there in the northern Rockies, and there's all the Pacific air flowing right in. For the central plains, uh, going to be kind of a similar picture there. Return flow over the next day or so. And then we'll see the Pacific system emerging. And there it comes right there. So that's going to come mostly from Montana and Wyoming on uh, Sunday morning. The rest of the area, Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas, that'll be under southerly flow there. Kind of a tropical warm uh, condition there. And then for afternoon highs, we're going to see that come up to about 76 in the Denver area. 83 there at uh, Kansas. And the front is on the way. And there it is. And you can see the strong northwesterly winds in the Cheyenne area. 51 there, contrasted with 76 at Lyman. So quite a strong front coming into western Nebraska and northern Colorado. For Texas, we're going to be under the influence of that high-pressure area up in the Great Lakes, giving us that light northerly flow. So cool nighttime temperatures, and we're... We're seeing about 74 here at this time. And that's going to be the case over the next 48 hours, just kind of an easterly component there. And since the component is out of the north instead of the south, that'll help moderate the temperatures. So by Sunday, Sunday morning, we're going to see temperatures in Texas right around 68 at DFW. Pretty much 68 all over Texas and a few 60s and 50s up in the Abilene area. And then afternoon highs on Sunday, those will come up into the 80s, which is better than 90s. The southeastern U.S., uh, that's going to be dominated by the tropical depression there on the Florida coast. And there it is. You can see it right there near uh, Vera Beach this evening. And that moves on up the coast to around Jacksonville by Saturday morning. And then we see the northerly component in much of the north, this southeast U.S. That'll keep temperatures kind of cool at nighttime. And then even during the afternoon, wow, looks like a few 70s there in northern Georgia and Alabama. And so here's our tropical system coming up into the Jacksonville area. And then the NAM model decides to take that inland. little departure there from what the GFS had forecasted. And then that kind of moves eastward as a easterly wave there. And then for the northeastern U.S., uh, the main influence there is going to be the northerly polar air mass. And there's that uh, little surface low associated with, with that mid-level system that I was showing you crossing the Great Lakes there. So pretty strong uh, pressure falls there around uh, Lake Ontario. And then over 9 to tomorrow, that'll kind of shift eastward toward uh, New York. And then in the wake of that, we'll get some pretty strong cold air advection. Lots of 50s there for tomorrow afternoon. And then highs are going to be pretty much in the 40s and 50s throughout much of New England and New York and Pennsylvania. And then we see some cold temperatures here for Sunday morning. All of these white areas, that's below freezing. So there's going to be some frost there in Ontario. Parts of Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania. Bit of a cold chill 
in the afternoon highs in the uh, 50s. And then after that, of course, it will be warming up. Okay, then we'll just kind of take a look at the long range, looking at the GFS. Kind of put things together and shift from a, a short range forecast to more of a medium range forecast. So there's the cold air. That's what's going to give the chill to the northeast U.S. And then going into Sunday and Monday, that high pressure causing that cold air across the northeast U.S., that'll move on off to the east. Here comes a new system coming out of uh, Canada on Wednesday. So the leading edge is going to be looking like this here. Kind of a stout uh, southeasterly flow in Texas. And that weak front uh, will kind of dissipate a little bit as it moves south. And then it looks like we have some new development out in Utah and Nevada there. Looks like an upper level system off the coast there, kind of a cutoff low around uh, California. And then it looks like uh, the next big change will be over the weekend around the 8th or 9th. A new system coming together there around Lake Superior down to Minnesota and Nebraska. We will still have a little bit of uh, baroclinicity in Arizona, so we're going to have to kind of keep an eye on that area. So that system blows through the eastern U.S. and the Midwest. High pressure coming down through the northern plains there. Lots of cold air advection throughout the uh, northeast U.S. And that will push all the way through Texas. And then the model is going for a little bit of a tropical system there in Florida and let's see where that came from that came a, I think we were looking at at that on yesterday's charts so this is about 200 hours out this is still kind of a long ways out and that kind of loiters over Florida and then pushes on off to sea there pretty cold for the northern US and uh, Yeah, look at this big high here on the 13th. So this is going to keep a northerly component to the winds across much of the eastern two-thirds of the U.S. Conditions below normal as far as temperatures in that area right there. And then it looks like we got the remains of a hurricane coming up into Arizona on the 14th. So we'll have to keep an eye on that right there. So that could potentially bring a whole lot of moisture to the Four Corners area. But this is three, 360 hours out, so we could see that end up in Mexico, up in California, or that could move on up the coast. So we just don't really know. This is pretty far out. And then we'll kind of compare that with the European model. Okay, so there goes the high pressure this weekend. Wow, pretty strong there. 1038 millibars as it moves to remain, as it exits. And then this is a time frame where we're talking about that tropical system in Florida. And yeah, the European model bringing that well to the northeast U.S. over the Bahamas and out to sea. So according to the European model, that's not even going to affect the U.S. And I would be a little bit more inclined to go with this. But we've got a lot of time to look at this. And look at that, another big high pressure area across Canada. There's the leading edge of some cold air about to come south around the 9th, according to the European model. So it looks like we're going to get an early start to the cold season here in about a week or two. Okay, uh, Ryan Toomey says waves are coming in from the Keys rolling north. The uh, precip there. 
the current upslope in Texas uh, is a lift over the cooler, denser air. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, in fact, if we look at the uh, soundings, let me bring up the soundings here. Yeah, I lost it there for a second. Um, let's see, we really need to have a sounding in Central Texas, and I'm not sure that... Uh, hang on a second. All right, Lake Charles. Yeah, there's the uh, northeasterly flow right there. This represents the cold air. So it's about maybe 6,000 feet uh, deep there, covering this layer right there. And Del Rio and Midland is where we're seeing a lot of that upslope flow there. So, yeah, it's essentially, uh, you can see how humid this air mass is in Del Rio. And you're bringing this up to higher and higher elevations from about 500 and 1,000 feet up to about 2,500 feet. So when you lift any part of this air mass up to higher elevations, you're going to get condensation taking place and that's what we're seeing there and you can see with the easterly component there that's going to take this humid air mass into the higher elevations. so yeah it's kind of a combination there of the surface based part of the air mass and I guess uh, we're probably not seeing too much overrunning it looks like the winds are pretty weak there in the mid levels And let me uh, check out Midland there. Very humid air mass. And uh, yeah, I think uh, here the cold air mass is a little bit shallower there at uh, Midland, topping out at about 5,000 feet MSL there. And there is a little bit of flow on top of that air mass. And I would expect there to be a little bit of isentropic lift on the top of that. Since obviously there's cooler air as you go up into the uh, Texas High Plains there. So any of this warm air advection in the mid-levels, that's going to result in some lift. And you combine that with this higher humidity there. And we're going to see uh, clouds and precip with that. So, yeah, a couple of uh, different factors helping to produce rain and precip in that part of Texas. Andrew Hotchkiss says it's on track for the second most dry September on record for Pittsburgh. Ryan says thanks for covering South Florida. And another, ouch, another hurricane strike. I don't know. According to the GFS, it's a hurricane strike, but uh, this is way out, like I said, the European model bringing that uh, tropical storm well to the east. So we might just luck out to not have to deal with that. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kathy Campbell, for the uh, note about the broadcasts. Hopefully we'll escape without hurricanes there in Florida. And uh, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close things out. And there's uh, probably an older song some of you might recognize. That's the song we used earlier this year, so we'll close it out with that. Anyway, thanks for joining, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Thank you.